known as La Madrina, the godmother and La Viuda Negra, the Black Widow, due to her ties with Pablo Escobar and the deaths of three of her husbands, Ana Griselda Blanco Restrepo was a trailblazer in the cocaine trafficking pipeline from Colombia to the United States. During her reign of terror in Florida, the Black Widow ordered as many as 250 revenge attacks every month, and her empire shipped over 3,400 pounds of cocaine into the country. Her distribution network spanned the entire U.S., generating a staggering $80 million monthly. Griselda Blanco was a formidable figure not to be trifled with. In fact, she instilled fear even in the notorious Pablo Escobar, who admitted, the only man I was ever afraid of was a woman named Griselda Blanco. In this video, we delve into the life of the only drug queen pin to break into the top 10 drug lord earners. Griselda Blanco was born on February 15, 1943 in Santa Marta, a city on Colombia's Caribbean coast. In 1955, she moved to Medellin with her mother, Ana Lucia Restrepo, who was a sex worker struggling with addiction and prone to violent outbursts. Their relocation to Medellin was due to a turbulent period in Colombia's history. In 1948, Colombia was rocked by violence following the assassination of a liberal leader in Bogota. This event sparked an undeclared civil war between the country's two main political parties. It was a time marked by brutal acts where political rivals would gruesomely eliminate their enemies and entire communities suffered for supporting the wrong politician. Amidst this chaos, children were often left abandoned in playgrounds, highlighting the extreme brutality of the era. Griselda Blanco grew up in the tough streets of Medellin, Colombia's second largest city. Her neighborhood, Barrio Antioquia, was a hotbed of crime filled with gangsters, prostitutes, and killers. It was so notorious that it was officially labeled a tolerance zone where illegal activities were tolerated, much like a red light district. Starting as a pickpocket, Griselda soon escalated her criminal activities. It is said that at just 11 years old, Griselda Blanco committed a shocking act. She kidnapped a boy her own age from a wealthier neighborhood, hoping to ransom him for money. However, when his parents didn't take her threat seriously, she made a chilling decision. Without hesitation, she ended the boy's life. It was a stark display of her willingness to do whatever it took to achieve her goals, even at such a young age. In the mid-1950s, at just 13 years old, Griselda Blanco escaped from her drunk and abusive mother. She crossed paths with Carlos Trujillo, a much older man involved in forgery and human trafficking. Trujillo was known for smuggling hundreds of Colombians into the United States annually. Over five years, he mentored Griselda in the dark art of forging passports, and she quickly mastered the skill of creating fake identities. Together, they organized the illegal smuggling of thousands of people into the United States. Trujillo became more than just a mentor. He was Griselda's partner, and some say her true love. He taught her everything he knew, particularly the ins and outs of smuggling. By the time Griselda turned 19, she and Carlos Trujillo were married with three sons, splitting their time between Colombia and New York. By the late 1960s, Carlos Trujillo met a sudden end. Officially, his death was attributed to liver failure. However, unofficially, suspicions arose, pointing towards Griselda as the one behind his demise. Griselda Blanco wasted no time in finding a replacement husband. Within barely three years, she had lined up Alberto Bravo. Unlike Trujillo, Bravo wasn't involved in people smuggling. Instead, he dealt in coke. Despite Bravo's existing gangster connections and real estate ventures, his drug business was relatively small scale, trafficking only modest amounts of coke. However, Blanco had grander ambitions. In the early 1970s, cocaine was still emerging as a popular party drug in America, but its potential for profit was evident. Blanco recognized this burgeoning market and saw an opportunity to establish a coke empire. With her criminal prowess and Bravo's connections, they were poised to capitalize on the growing demand for coke in the United States. Together, Blanco and her new partner were primed to make a significant impact on the drug trade 
initiating a crime wave that would reverberate across the nation. At this stage, it becomes apparent that Griselda Blanco strategically cultivates relationships with men that offer her economic and social advantages from the outset. As the new decade began, Griselda Blanco and Alberto Bravo were residing in Queens, New York City. Leveraging Trujillo's old people smuggling network, Blanco efficiently distributed coke throughout the city. Simultaneously, she devised innovative methods to smuggle drugs into America. One of her most notorious techniques involved modified bras. The first step in Griselda Blanco's operation involves her lover and business partner Bravo, purchasing coke in Bolivia and Peru. They then transport it across the unguarded borders to Colombia, where it's repackaged in Blanco's hometown of Medellin. As a woman operating in a male-dominated world, Blanco's stroke of genius is devising a new method to smuggle coke into the U.S. She decides to conceal the drugs in garments, ensuring they blend in with a woman's natural figure. Blanco specifically selects Colombian women as her mules and trains them to use their sexuality to distract border guards, encouraging the women to dress attractively and be flirtatious with customs and immigration agents. Blanco ensures the success of her operation. Each woman carries a kilo of coke aboard flights to the U.S., resulting in a net profit of $10,000 per mule. To the average customs officer, Blanco's drug mules appear as just particularly voluptuous women, making it unlikely they would suspect that they're concealing coke in padded bras. It was a deceptively simple plan, yet remarkably effective in evading detection. The mules landed in New York, where Griselda's underground network of Colombian distributors eagerly awaited their arrival. Within hours, the coke was distributed and made its way onto the streets. Within just a couple of years, Griselda Blanco and Alberto Bravo flooded New York City with white powder. They had so thoroughly dominated the market that even the mafia struggled to compete. While Pablo Escobar was still a low-level criminal, Blanco was raking in over $10 million per week in drug profits. As New York DEA agents investigated the sudden influx of coke, they encountered a wall of terrified silence from those they questioned. The message on the streets was clear. Crossing paths with Griselda Blanco meant risking her formidable retaliation. However, even the strongest silence can crack. One of the DEA top agents was Robert Nives, a Puerto Rican-American who grew up in Brooklyn, New York. He was recruited by the DEA to tackle the Colombian drug trade. His partner, Bob Palombo, was a Spanish-speaking narcotics expert. After three years of investigation, they finally caught a break. Two years into their operation, they arrested a small-time dealer who faced a 30-year prison sentence. Fearing the consequences, the dealer agreed to cooperate with the government. He revealed that his supplier was a woman named Leela Parada. Parada worked within the organization as a distributor, and the NYPD identified her early on as being involved. Robert Nives and Bob Palombo realized that while Parada might not be a big fish, she could still provide vital information about the true masterminds of the distribution network. To gather intel, they wired her apartment and listened to conversations. However, this task wasn't easy. They lacked sophisticated technology, and the Spanish spoken was in code. Colombian traffickers had their own slang and codes, making deciphering conversations challenging. Phrases like, somebody has left the funeral, could mean Coke was en route to New York, while beautiful children with good bones might refer to high-quality Coke with crystal. Not only did they speak in guarded terms and camouflage their conversations, but they also used a jargon unique to the Median neighborhood they grew up in, making it difficult at times to understand the essence of their discussions. To add to the challenge, all the names used by the Colombians were fake. They operated under aliases, never revealing their real identities. They possessed excellent false IDs, ranging from driver's licenses to passports, with multiple names associated with those documents. However, in the transcripts, two code names appeared more frequently than others, Carmen and Gloria Caban. 
These sisters were already serving time for coke trafficking and were considered veteran drug mules. It was believed that they had connections to key players in the Colombian coke network. Robert Neves visited the older sister, Carmen Caban, in prison, but even from her secure cell, she refused to talk. Neves made her an offer, placement in witness protection and the chance to see her family again. Unable to resist the offer, Caban revealed the names of 37 Colombians involved in drug dealings in New York alone. Finally, she disclosed the name of the ruthless criminal mastermind behind it all, Griselda Blanco. Operation Banshee was initiated to gather evidence against Griselda Blanco, resulting in the preparation of 37 indictments. However, before federal authorities could take action, Blanco vanished. Thanks to her expertise in document forgery acquired from Carlos Trujillo, Blanco could effortlessly assume a new identity at a moment's notice. Upon learning of the imminent threat, Blanco and Bravo swiftly abandoned their lives in New York, boarded planes with new passports, and disappeared back to Colombia. However, returning to Colombia proved to be a fateful decision for Blanco. The median of 1975 had changed significantly from the one she left behind. A new, ruthless gangster was rising to power, Pablo Escobar. Compared to Escobar, Blanco seemed like a novice in the world of crime. Escobar's emergence would soon turn Blanco's life into a nightmare. In 1975, Griselda Blanco faced a string of setbacks, marking a particularly challenging year for the notorious drug queen pin. As she attempted to reclaim territory taken by Pablo Escobar, Blanco resorted to her ruthless methods, including eliminating her rivals with hired assassins. Blanco adhered to the belief that she needed to be even tougher than the toughest men in the criminal world. It's even rumored that she pioneered the practice of murder by Sicario, where a gunman on a motorbike swiftly carries out an assassination before disappearing. Despite Blanco's formidable reputation, she found herself constantly trailing behind Escobar. No matter how tough she became, she struggled to keep up with the relentless rise of Pablo Escobar. Pablo Escobar intensified his efforts against Griselda Blanco by hiring entire teams of hitmen to eliminate her associates. Simultaneously, he seized control of her drug laboratories, tightening the squeeze on Blanco's operations. As Blanco faced mounting pressure in her professional life, her personal life also took a dark turn. Her husband, Alberto Bravo, began spending increasing amounts of time away from Median, allegedly in Bogota. Rumors swirled that Bravo was involved in an affair and contemplating leaving Blanco to pursue his own ventures independently. Things reached a boiling point when Griselda Blanco discovered that their organization was missing millions of dollars. In the parking lot outside a popular club in rainy Bogota, she confronted her husband, demanding answers. However, instead of explanations, Alberto Bravo pulled out an Uzi and gunfire erupted, shattering the night. When the echoes faded, Blanco remained standing, wounded but alive, while Bravo lay dead. This brutal act solidified Blanco's reputation as the Black Widow. Without a hint of remorse, she returned to Medellin that very night showing no signs of faltering in her ruthless pursuits. Within a year, Griselda Blanco remarried, this time to Dario Sepulveda, an associate of the notorious drug-smuggling Ochoa brothers. When they welcomed a son in 1978, she named him Michael Corleone Blanco, after the protagonist of the Godfather movies. By the end of the 1970s, Blanco faced a difficult decision. Pablo Escobar, now head of the Medellin cartel, had effectively taken control of her home city. With virtually everyone in the drug business aligning with Escobar, Blanco encountered an opponent tougher and more ruthless than herself. Faced with this reality, she had two options, continue fighting and inevitably lose or flee. Wisely, Blanco chose the latter. At the end of the decade, she donned her latest disguise, boarded a plane, and returned to the United States. However, she didn't go back to New York. Instead, she set her sights on Miami, a city that was on the brink of becoming a central hub in the global drug trade. By 1980, 
Colombia was responsible for producing a staggering three-quarters of all the coke worldwide. A significant portion of this, around 70%, was trafficked through South Florida, with more than $20 billion worth of product flowing into Miami annually. Upon her return to the U.S., Griselda Blanco wasted no time in rebuilding her distribution network. However, with Cuban gangs already controlling the streets of Miami, she faced the daunting task of carving out a new niche for herself. This endeavor led to a wave of chaos and violence, with Blanco at the center. From 1980 to 1981, the so-called cartel wars engulfed Miami, resulting in the city having the highest murder rate of any city in the Americas, surpassing even Medellin in its brutality. At one point, the number of corpses in Miami became so overwhelming that the city coroner had to resort to storing them in a refrigerated truck rented from Burger King. However, Griselda Blanco's influence extended beyond the realm of street warfare. With her three sons, Dixon, Uber, and Oswaldo, each managing distribution in different cities, Blanco's drug empire flourished. They were able to sell over 1,500 kilograms of coke every month, bringing in massive amounts of money that needed to be laundered extensively. Blanco invested a significant portion of her drug profits into Miami's real estate market, like many other coke drug lords of the time. Her investments contributed to an economic boom in the city. Despite losing control of Medellin by the early 1980s, Griselda was living in a luxurious Florida mansion, establishing herself as one of the wealthiest women in the United States. In 1983, Dario Sepulveda grew frustrated with Griselda Blanco's decision to keep their son, Michael, out of school. He took the boy back to Medellin, and while Sepulveda was driving around the city with Michael, they were flagged down by police. Without warning, the officers opened fire, fatally shooting Sepulveda and covering the car's interior with his blood. They then calmly retrieved the crying Michael and returned him to Miami to be with his mother. However, even orchestrating Sepulveda's murder in front of their son wasn't the most chilling action taken by Griselda. Infamously, she ordered a hit at the Dadeland Mall, resulting in bullets being unleashed into crowds, killing two people and injuring two others. A young detective with the Miami police is called to the scene of a shooting at the home of a Colombian family, the Lorenzos. However, this is no ordinary homicide. The Lorenzos are known coke dealers, and their killers sought revenge. The scene is grisly. The victims are tied up with belts and telephone cords, showing signs of torture. They have been shot multiple times in the torso and head, indicating a violent overkill. The evidence points to a connection with coke, leaving the DEA with no doubt that the Black Widow is back and more lethal than ever. This brutal method of resolving problems with a hit aligns with Blanco's notorious modus operandi. But perhaps the most heart-wrenching tale is that of Johnny Castro, a mere two-year-old boy. Johnny was unlucky enough to be in the car with his father when one of Blanco's hitmen on a motorbike opened fire. Although the bullets missed the father, two tragically struck Johnny in the skull, claiming his innocent life. Shockingly, when Blanco learned of the toddler's death, she expressed satisfaction, viewing it as a means to exact revenge on Johnny's father. As Miami entered the mid-1980s, Griselda Blanco, the coke godmother, was at the peak of her power. She had become the first female cartel boss to amass over a billion dollars, firmly establishing her dominance in the coke market. Feared by all, Blanco had successfully cornered the market and solidified her place as a formidable force in the criminal underworld. Here's the reality of ordering the murders of countless drug traffickers. They leave behind friends and family who are often armed and ready to seek revenge. Griselda Blanco found herself in this precarious situation in 1984. Living in a city teeming with vengeful individuals eager to retaliate against her, Blanco had no choice but to abruptly leave Miami and go into hiding in California after just half a decade in the city. For the DEA, tracking down Griselda Blanco had become an obsession ever since she fled back to Colombia in 1975.
As it became evident that Blanco had returned to the U.S., agents intensified their efforts, utilizing informants, wiretaps, and raids on coke distribution centers. Finally, Blanco resurfaced in California, and the DEA seized an opportunity. In April 1983, Bob Palombo gets the opportunity he's been waiting for. While serving time for narcotics trafficking, the DEA discovers a Colombian named Jerry Gomez, who might provide access to Griselda Blanco's inner family circle. Gomez, a businessman who knows Blanco's three sons, from her first husband, Carlos Trujillo, had sold motorcycles to Blanco's sons in Medellin, Colombia. The plan is to release Gomez from his 10-year sentence and send him undercover. Gomez is to approach one of Blanco's sons, offering to launder money for them across their national network. The goal is to eventually locate Blanco and her other two sons. It's a risky gamble, as they won't know if they can trust Gomez until it's too late. Gomez sets up a meeting in California with Griselda Blanco's youngest son, 37-year-old Dixon. Initially, Jerry manages to interest Dixon in the proposition, and Dixon seems ready to take the bait. Wearing a wire, Gomez keeps his composure, and Dixon doesn't appear to suspect he's being set up. Dixon even reveals that his mother frequently moves between Miami and L.A., but he doesn't provide further details. At the end of the meeting, the team is uncertain if they've done enough to lure Dixon into revealing his mother's whereabouts. Three weeks later, Gomez receives a call, but it's not from Dixon Blanco, it's from the Black Widow herself. Griselda Blanco has taken the bait, marking a significant breakthrough in the investigation. In 1984, Gomez met Blanco at an L.A. hotel under the guise of assisting her with money laundering. Although Blanco remained guarded in her conversations, she let slip enough details about her criminal activities for the DEA to begin preparing an arrest warrant. Jerry Gomez, though terrified, managed to extract a crucial piece of information, the address of a Los Angeles distributor. Palumbo wasted no time obtaining a warrant to search the property. While reviewing the evidence gathered, they stumbled upon a utility bill for an apartment in Irvine. Palumbo's instincts screamed that this Irvine apartment was precisely the kind of residence Blanco would choose to lay low. It was upscale, yet not extravagant. He knew he had to act swiftly before she vanished once again. During a raid prompted by the utility bill found, Griselda Blanco was tracked down to this anonymous apartment in California on February 17, 1985. That evening, her luck finally ran out as DEA agents burst in to find Blanco shocked and surprised, sitting in bed. In the aftermath of her arrest, Blanco's three eldest sons were also apprehended, and their distribution network was dismantled, effectively ending their coke empire. On June 25, 1985, Blanco found herself in the dock facing charges. Two weeks later, the jury found her guilty of one count of conspiracy to manufacture, import drugs into the United States, and distribute coke. The judge sentenced her to 15 years in prison. This marked the end of Blanco's reign as the coke queen pin. Initially, she fought using legal methods, but after her final appeal was dismissed in 1988, she resorted to illegal means. Around this time, there were claims that Griselda Blanco devised a scheme to kidnap John F. Kennedy Jr. and demand her release from prison in exchange for his freedom. However, none of her plans came to fruition. Blanco never managed to orchestrate a prison breakout, nor did she carry out any kidnappings of political figures' sons. Despite these failed attempts, Blanco's story was far from over. Even though Griselda Blanco was behind bars, the rage that led her to flee Miami persisted. Many sought revenge against her, but since they couldn't reach her directly, they targeted those closest to her. The first casualty was Osvaldo, Blanco's son, who was shot with a submachine gun at his welcome home party in Medellin in 1992, shortly after his release from prison. Blanco, unable to attend the funeral, sent a threatening note read through a priest at the funeral, promising retribution for her son's murder. True to her word, her other son, Dixon, tracked down the shooter, torturing him to death. However, Dixon soon met a similar fate, followed by Blanco's third son. 
In 1994, Blanco was extradited to Miami to stand trial for the murders of the Lorenzo family and two-year-old Johnny Castro. Prosecutors relied on the testimony of Blanco's former hitman, Jorge Ayala, but the case collapsed when it was revealed that Ayala had been engaging in inappropriate relations with two secretaries from the prosecutor's office. Desperate to salvage something from the humiliating debacle, prosecutors struck a plea deal with Griselda. In exchange for pleading guilty to secondary murder, she received a sentence of just 20 years, including time served. This meant she would walk free in 2004. Blanco accepted the deal, and in the early 21st century, the woman who had once been the godmother of Coke left prison behind and returned to Colombia. However, her old underworld had changed drastically. Pablo Escobar, her former rival, had been dead for over a decade. The Ochoa brothers were either imprisoned or out of the drug game. Many of her enemies were gone, and no one awaited her with a gun as she stepped off the plane. Colombia's era of narco-terror was over, although the country still grappled with civil unrest. Overall, it was safer than it had been in decades. Griselda Blanco settled into a quiet retirement in Medellin, taking up residence in an apartment complex for the moderately wealthy. Over time, she gained weight, reportedly found religion, and embraced a life away from her notorious past as the godmother of Coke. Content to live in obscurity, she believed she had been forgotten by both friend and foe alike. However, on Monday, September 3, 2012, her sense of security was shattered when a motorbike pulled up outside a butcher shop in Medellin. A middle-aged man calmly entered the shop where Blanco was buying meat. Without warning, he pulled out a gun and shot her twice in the head before swiftly fleeing the scene on his bike, disappearing into the morning traffic. It became apparent that there was still some enemies who had not forgotten the debt they owed Griselda Blanco, a bullet for her past crimes. Blanco was 69 years old at the time of her death. On January 25, 2024, Netflix debuted a six-episode miniseries titled Griselda, based on the life of Griselda Blanco. Blanco wasn't your average drug lord. She was a shrewd businesswoman who established one of the most lucrative drug cartels in history, all while balancing the challenges of raising a family. Thank you for watching. If you enjoyed this video, please take a moment to like and subscribe for more captivating content. If you found this video interesting, you'll definitely enjoy the one showing on your screen now. Click on it, and I'll see you in the next one.